Thank you, Rip. All right, let's pray one more time. Now we start. Father, I thank you uh, again that we could all come together and worship and, and sing and even do memory verses together. Uh, please give me clarity of speech and, and help use your word uh, to work in all of our hearts now as we uh, look at this together. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight is our final night of the class, uh, which is kind of sad. Um, but it's a good night, it's a good send-off class, because we're talking about engaged membership and what that means uh, for the church and what that means for you guys in this class uh, and why it's important, even why it would be something that we would call like one of our main things that we do at GBC. Um, and we don't have the nice cool arrow up here on the board, but we have this idea of uh, four E's. Um, we've talked about this the past few weeks. We have this expository preaching, the exposition of God's word, and that's central to, to what we do as a church and how we um, believe that God's word is the, is the priority for all of us in, in ministry and in personal life, and it's really what fuels our uh, beliefs at this church. And then from that, we have uh, the next E was elder leadership. And so we, we get that from what God's word says about how um, his church is to be ordered and structured. And so we have men here who are elders who teach God's word, who, who are preaching it and teaching it and leading God's people through it. And the people then at this church who are gathering together and committed under this, under these elders even, and committed to this preaching of the word are engaged members. So that's the next E. So last week we looked at the last E, which was expanding missions. Uh, but this week we're looking at engaged members. And so engaged members are the ones that are expanding the mission, so to speak. Uh, but it's the, the final one that we're looking at this week. And so to start off, um, I want to start with a statement, which I thought was uh, a pretty helpful statement in thinking about the Christian life and um, how that interacts with the church. And so this is a pastor, and he said, your Christian faith is personal, but it is not private. Your, pers your Christian faith is personal, but it is not private. Uh, what, what do you think that means? Relations. Okay, so it's a relationship with who? With the uh, first with Christ, okay. with God, the Father, and then with the uh, brother, sister as a member. Okay, yeah. So there's there's this vertical relationship and then this horizontal relationship. Yes. Okay. So uh, I want everybody to turn to Ephesians four real quick. And we'll look at briefly kind of this idea of what this this um, Christian faith that right, if, we're, if we're saying we're a Christian, if we're proclaiming a, a faith in, in Christ, um, it is a personal faith, but it's not a secret faith. It's not a private faith, and it's not a faith that is meant to be apart from other people who are also sharing that confession. Uh, so I'm going to start in, in verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and, page, and with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each of one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is he is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry to the building up of the body of Christ 
until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And then yeah, we'll just keep going. It's so good. We'll just keep going all the way. Uh, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building of, of itself in love. And so this, this extended passage there in Ephesians 4 is really getting at this idea that yes, right, you, you have this uh, faith in Christ, and that is a relationship that you have with God, and this unique relationship that, as we saw even last week in talking about this expanding mission, this, this relationship that lets you have this um, closeness with God that really up until Jesus came, has not been experienced, right? And it's going to be fully experienced for forever in heaven. Right? You have that relationship as a Christian. Yet, you also have this relationship with one another. And God's even given gifts to the church, even like through elders and through, through teachers, to help the church as a whole be able to be united in faith, right? And, and, and growing up for the work of ministry, so that the saints themselves can be able to do this ministry and where is this ministry taking place? And what's it for? Like it's taking place in the church and it's for the church, right? It's, it's this ministry that, that is growing and building up this body. And that, so that you can see all the way at the end. So that it's growing up the body and uh, building itself up in love. Like this is the whole body coming together and working together. And so when we say, right, when this pastor is saying your, your Christian faith is personal, but it's not private, it's meaning that your faith as a believer is meant to be plugged into a body. It's meant to be growing and, and building up and loving and encouraging and interacting with and being taught and being connected to other believers in the body in a church. And so that's we have to start there when we're talking about engaged membership, because we actually have to talk about what you're a member of first, right? And so what's a church, right? That's supposed to be a question mark there, so you can add a little one right there on your page. What is a church? We've talked about this probably like four or five different classes now, um, but does anyone have a, a short, brief answer of what is a church? There's a group of believers that studies the word and shares in the sacraments and gathers regularly. Okay, and they're all united by what? Common belief. Yeah, common belief in what? I heard it over here. The gospel, right? They're they're a group of Christians, right, who are gathered together, like a group of believing, gospel believing Christians who are gathered around the preaching of the gospel and the practice of the ordinances. And we're gonna get into that a little bit more. Um, but I want to talk about kind of the two sides of the coin of why we would talk about church membership. Um, and, and I would say that, I don't know, I think that scripture gives room to be a little bit blunt in one sense. And it's really, if you're a Christian, then you should be an engaged member of a gospel preaching church. And, and I think the Bible is pretty clear on that. Even we'll get into what the implications are and how that actually plays out in scripture. Um, but then on the other side of the coin is, if you're not a Christian, then you shouldn't be a member of a church, right? So, there, so the church then is really supposed to be a, a, a group of believers and not have any unbelievers in that church, in that sense. And so the membership is, is this way of trying to determine who is a believer and who's not a believer. And are they in our church or not? And so um, in this conversation then tonight, like we're going to be targeting like the person who's not a Christian, right? As in like, you need to become a Christian so that you can be part of this church, be part of this, this body that Christ has built um, on this earth right now. And I'm talking to the Lone Ranger Christian. So the Christian that is just going through life and it's like, I can be a Christian by myself and I don't need this other, I don't need these entangling relationships, or I don't need that accountability or that commitment or whatever that is. Um, but then it's also talking to the Christian who's participating in the benefits of membership in a church uh, without really the accountability that comes along with what membership is supposed to provide. 
And I'm also just talking to the Christian who is a member of the church, right? And, and I know that there's, uh, I know I at least right that some of those categories are in this room, uh, even tonight. But for the Christian who's a member of the church, like this is an encouragement to you to, to see what God has called uh, members to do in the church. And so when we're looking at this, what is a church? We're talking about, right, not a building. It's not an event that happens, but it's people who are gospel believing and gospel celebrating. And they're committed to one another through that one gospel confession. Um, we did a memory verse, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. I'm not going to ask anybody to do that one right now, but we did that. Um, and uh, just listen to it. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So the church, in one sense, is this people that, that God has made, that God has has called out that he's saved, and they're together, right? He, Peter doesn't write, like, but you are a whole bunch of just different chosen people all scattered around. Right? You're a holy nation, but like all individually apart. You're a people that's like not a people, right? You're all separate. Now he's, he's talking about you as a group, as a collective. And so the question is, how are you grouped? How are you, how are you assembled? How are you gathering with those people? And so... As some of us, uh, some of you guys have already said, and we've talked about before, it's a group of people that are committed to gathering around the preaching of the gospel and the practice of the ordinances. Um, and we're going to get to why the gospel is really important in a second. Um, but practicing the ordinances, what is that showing? What have we talked about already in this class about the ordinances? Shows obedience to Christ's command. Okay, so one, right, is this, it is, there, it's a Christian who is following Christ and even following Christ in obedience to what he said to do. Okay, yep, what else? What, what is the, what's the proclamation of baptism? Is that I'm, I'm not in the world, right? I am, I am now with Christ, right? I, I have, I have forsaken that life and I now have a life that's following Christ. And then who is, who are the people that are baptizing? It's the church. It's the church then affirming, yes, that is true. And so in one sense, it's, it's like a handshake, right? It's the, one hand is reached out and the other hand, like we're grabbing you. We're pulling you in with us and saying, hey, we are in this church together. You, you share the same confession with us. And what is communion doing? Proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, so it's proclaiming right, like, like the gospel, like even in this kind of visible, tangible sense. And then what is it doing for, for one another? It's really it's pointing to everybody else who's taking communion and saying, look, like we, we share the gospel. Like this person, this person who's taking it over here, they're a fellow believer with me. And in another sense, like we are committed to the same thing together as this body together, taking this Lord's Supper together. So in a way, the ordinances themselves even set out and point to who is in the church and who's not, right? If you have somebody, just Joe Schmo Christian, that's living in Southern Chesterfield, and we did baptize him and he's not taking communion with us, but he's a Christian, right? Is he a Christian here? No, he's not, he's not really part of this gathering at all, right? But, but if we had baptized him, right, and he, and he came in and declared his testimony to all of us, we baptized him into our body, and then he's showing up and he's participating and he's taking communion with us, then we'd say, well, he's a Christian who's here with us, right? So in one sense, like those little things, uh, those little ordinances kind of show who's in and who's not. It's just like little tangible things. Yes. What if those who cannot no longer, who can any longer come to the church we share communion together, or you know, fellowship together. Then, what do you call them? So they can't come to our church anymore. Yeah. But they used to be a member here. Yeah. Well, then we would tell them. We would tell them, hey, you need to go to a church that you can't be a member. But they're sick, then they Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, I mean, we would say that there is definitely, God providentially hinders some from being able to come every time we do communion um, as a church. And, and we do have shut-ins that can't ever get out of the house. And so, in a sense, we know we've heard their testimony. We know they're believers. We know that they would be here if they could be here. Um, but that in God's providence, they're hindered from being with us. But that's different, and we're going to get to this later. But that's different from somebody that 
could be here if they wanted to, but they aren't because they're fishing every Sunday morning, right? <laughs> Even though they're a member here, they're baptized, they want to, to say they're part of our church, but if they are never here, they're never even like participating in the things that kind of show who our church is, then that's a problem, right? And, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but the ordinances are in a way of saying who's in and who's out. And that's kind of the, the big thing that membership is doing. Is it showing who is in and who's out? Um, I just have a couple like brief scriptural examples. We're not going to turn them. We're just going to bounce through them. So Matthew 18, right? Is this? Um, it's the the biblical restoration, right, of somebody who's running away in sin, and this is where you would go to them and you say, "Hey, this is you're an unrepentant sin. You need to repent." And they don't repent. So what do you do? You go and you grab somebody else with you and you go back to them and say, hey, you need to repent and turn back. You need to hold to the confession that you have made, right? And if they don't do that, then what do you do next? Take it to the church. You take it to the church. Okay, so that implies what? That there's a church that you can, there's a group of people that you can take it to that um, that you would be a part of, right? You can't, you're not just saying, you're not just grabbing some random sending Christian and showing up at some random church and just saying, hey guys, deal with it, right? You're, you're going to the church where you are a part of and that person is also a part of. Um, Acts 2. So Peter preaches uh, after Pentecost. The the Jews that are that are hearing it, that are um, being convicted, they're, they're pierced to the heart and say, what do we do to be saved, right? And, and Peter's preaching, he's been preaching the gospel to them. He's repent and be baptized, right? And the ones that respond in faith, right? And respond in obedience to, to what Peter said and, and, and this gospel message, right? They believe, right? And they, they're baptized. And what does it say at the end of Acts? It says that they were, ba- they were that day, 3,000 were added to their number, right? The Lord added those to their number. To the number of who, right? That's kind of the, it's going to be this recurring question. Who was being added to who? Well, these 3,000 people were being added to the number of the people that were in the church in Jerusalem. So there's there's at least some sense of knowing who is in and who is not in, right? Acts 7, we have the widows who are being left out of the, the daily distribution of the bread. And so this is, this is where we get our proto-deacon idea of like what deacons are supposed to be doing and supposed to be helping the elders be able to do the ministry of, of the word and a prayer. But we have a list of deacons. There's apparently there are deacons that there are people that are so supposed to be serving, right? That know who is one of the widows and who isn't, right? They they aren't just going around randomly in Jerusalem and just handing out bread to whoever. They have a list. They know who is part of their body and who isn't. Uh, and I think probably the most compelling case of like who is in and who is out is in First Corinthians five, where Paul is talking to the Corinthians. And he's saying, hey, you have a person who is in blatant, unrepentant sin, hardened in his sin, in your midst, in your body. You need to remove him from your body. He tells the church to do that, and the the church is supposed to be the ones that are doing that. We'll, We'll talk about that idea later. But what's very clear, you can be removed out of something, that means you can also be put into something. Um, so this is kind of getting at this idea of membership, of that, of that group of people that, that somehow, some way, they know who is in and who is out. And so what is membership? What's a member? Well, let's start with the first basic thing. Um, what, what, is, what is this idea of membership and what's a member? Um, I think a helpful way to, to think through this is it's a person professing faith in Christ committing to a church and a church committing to them to help them walk through the Christian life faithfully. If you want to think about it in those ideas, I think that's kind of this thing. It's this, there's a hands reached out and the other hand grabs it. And then together you're into this uh, Christian life. There's a person who's professing Christ. They're saying, I'm a Christian. And the church is saying, we see that you're a Christian and we're going to help you, right? We're going to, we're going to be together in this um, Christian walk together. You want to give that earlier definition again, just like you said it a moment ago, and you explained it. But the first first the, one, uh, the, the one people, I just said. The um, yeah. So what is membership? It's it's a person professing faith in Christ and committing to a church, and a church committing to them to help them walk through the Christian life faithfully. And 
And we're going to kind of go through each of those things first. Because we have, to, we have to start there with a person professing faith in Christ. Um, and, and we're going to even walk through, um, one of our elders was gracious enough to share with me what he does uh, with his membership uh, questions as when he's doing a membership meeting. And we're just going to talk about like, what does it even mean to be a Christian, right? What does it mean to be a Christian? Um, wh what is a Christian, right? Who, who, what is a Christian? What is a Christian believing in? Not your question. Just like somebody. God. Jesus. <laughs> they believe in God. They believe in the Bible. Okay, but like what makes them a Christian, right? There's a lot of people that say, oh, I believe in Jesus or I believe in God. Trusting in Christ alone for salvation. Okay, so trusting in Christ alone for salvation, right? They have faith in Christ that Christ is going to save them from what? Sin. Their sin, right? They're, the just punishment that they deserve. They, they're saying Christ took my punishment in my place on the cross. He died for me and his life, right? His life, life resurrection proves, right, that he paid my sin penalty and that he gives me his righteousness so that I don't even have to try to earn my righteousness in any way. Christ gives me his righteousness. I mean, it's the great exchange. He gets my sin. I get Christ's righteousness. And then I get that, that union with Christ so that I get to live with him as, as a brother even. And, and God would treat me as his son. It's amazing. So that's what it is to be a Christian. Um, but I think it's helpful to, to think through um, what are some of the things that other people would say that they're a Christian? Like what, what are some things that, that the world would say is the, is the mark of a Christian? Who goes to church? Okay, so somebody who goes to church. Okay, no, that, but that's a, very, that's a very fair thing to say. And in fact... Some people, right, they think that, like, if I just go to his church, not only am I a Christian, but I'm also a member of this church, right? So that would be uh, a, a wrong belief, right? Um, what else do people say about being a Christian? Yes, Jesus in my heart. Okay, so I, I just, I, I did, I prayed the prayer, I walked when they said to walk at VBS, so I'm a Christian, I'm good to go. Um, what else? My grandma's real devout. Okay, yeah. So I come from a family. I come from a family of Christians. So of course I'm obviously a Christian. Uh, what else? Someone say I'm baptized, so I'm good. Okay, yeah. So I got baptized, right? I, I did the thing that they told me to do, and I'm I'm safe. I'm good. So how do you know if you're really a Christian or not? So it's, it comes first to that. What do you believe in? What are you believing in and putting your hope in? For salvation, um, and so that's where we have to go to the gospel. You have to, you have to go to the good news, right? Just because, even like, I mean, I know some of you guys do VCU evangelism on a pretty regular basis, Daniel, Julia. I'm sure people tell you all the time, "Oh yeah, I'm a Christian." Um, but then it's like, well, what, what are you believing in? What are you hoping in that's going to save you? And sometimes they're like, "Save me!" Like, what do I need to be saved from? So that's a very dead giveaway right there. Um, but what, what are they believing in? Well, they have to believe in the gospel, right? Um, yeah, John 6, 28 to 29. And they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Like, God would send his son not so that everybody then would have to work their way to be able to have this relationship with the Son. But God sent His Son so that people would be able to believe in Him and have faith and then get salvation. Um, so it's not through a work that you can do. But what's the other side of it, right? So somebody says, right, I, I believed, I was at VBS, I got baptized, I, I, I think I'm a Christian, I believe I'm a Christian. So what's the, what's the other side of it? How do, we, how do we see if somebody's a Christian or not? How do we know if somebody's a Christian or not? Changed heart, changed life. Okay, yeah. So it's someone who's been changed by the gospel, right? Somebody who believes in the gospel, but also somebody who's been changed by the gospel. And so um, the Spirit, right, working in our hearts, saving us and, and sanctifying us, uh, bears that fruit out in our lives. And so when we're talking to somebody, are you a Christian or not? Like we're, we're seeing, well, what do you believe? And then what is what does your life look like? How have you been changed by this gospel? Because you can say, I believe... But then if I'm just living in blatant, unrepentant sin, and it doesn't seem like I care at all, right? There's a disharmony there. That, that doesn't work. So it, you need to see both of those things, really, to, to know if somebody's a Christian or not. So see what, they, what they're saying they believe in, and then see how it's 
changing their life. And so, we're talking about a member, a membership. The first thing that has to happen is that they have to be a, a born again Christian, right? They have to be uh, believing in the gospel and believing in Christ alone for salvation. They need to be somebody who's been changed by the gospel. And that's what's so wonderful about these baptism testimonies that we do at, at SEFs and just hearing even young people coming up and, and saying, look, this is who I was. Like from ages like one to 13, I was a mess. And then at 14, right, I, I can see how God has changed my life, right, through through the gospel, through this good news, right? and seeing that it's not me anymore. It, it's Christ working in me and, and working this life in me. And those testimonies, right, they're, they're showing what they believe in, and they're showing a changed life. Okay, so that's the first part. Somebody needs to be a Christian. All right, so that next part then is somebody that is, is regularly gathering with an assembly of believers. And I don't know, I think you maybe can quibble on what does regularly gathering mean. I mean, is it like, it's, it, we would all probably say, well, it's not once a year. That's not, that's not regular enough. But I mean, there's, all, but if it's not every Sunday, right, then it's like, well, no, like, clearly also like you miss a Sunday. Like that's not like the, not like all of a sudden you're not a Christian and you're not, you're being disobedient. So clearly there's some room there. But the idea of what regular gathering means um, should be something to, to be more than just like once a year and more than just like once a month. Um, I, I mean, obviously, there's other circumstances that can also um, hinder somebody. I would honestly say regular gathering would be enough where people will understand you and know you enough to hold you accountable and for you to have fellowship with believers. So even, yeah, if you miss a few Sundays or maybe you just come to two Sundays a month. Or among, if people know you, mm -hmm. people do that, that would be regular. Yeah, well, and I think part of it is the reason why are you missing Sundays, right? Um, there's a, a pretty clear command in Scripture, right, to, to not forsake the gathering right, in Hebrews. And so, um, so why would one be forsaking the gathering? Well, if it's like, yeah, one Sunday I have to work about every month. Like, okay, that's understandable. If it's like, yeah, because I go I go fishing or hunting for three of the four Sundays every month. It's like, well, that's not good because that means you're making a choice there to, to 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 be hindered. And even somebody right that that has to that works a job that keeps them every Sunday from ever being able to gather with the saints. Like uh, the solution that I think a lot of people would say was like, well, then brother, get a different job. <laughs> it's it's it, that, that's for your own spiritual health and, and good to be able to gather with the saints. Um, but this, who is a member or who should be a member, right? It's somebody who is a Christian who's regularly gathering. And so um, I think, again, when we're talking to, that, to the person who claims to be a Christian, right, in Monroe Park, a VCU, wherever, and, and they're like, yeah, I'm a Christian and I believe the gospel. And you're like, cool, cool, cool. Like, what church do you go to? Like, I don't go to church. I don't think that's necessary or required or important or whatever they say, right? At least, at the very least, right? There's a blatant disregard to what, what God's commanded in his word about gathering with other saints. And so it would be fair to challenge. Like, are, are you a believer? Because God says that you will love his people, right? God says you're going to be a part of his people. And it seems like you're not wanting that at all. Um, and so that's actually how you can t even tell who's a Christian in some ways. Is do you have a love for the brothers or not? Um, but then the, the final part of what makes a member a member versus just a Christian who's going to a place where there are members is a commitment. It's a commitment. And we see that the church is more than just a group of believers who gather, but it's a group of believers who are committed to one another and it's kind of, it gets to the idea of how you know who's in the number and who's not. How you know who's in or not. In other words, like you, you claim the church, the church also has to claim you. Um, and there's not a single verse, there's not a, a single verse that you can go to and say, like, well, here it is, like, be a member of a church. But there's an overwhelming amount of scripture um, that would imply that we we should do something that is like membership, right? It doesn't, it doesn't put a label on it, membership, but it, it implies that there is something there. 
Uh, so Jesus calls for us to follow him, right? And, and following him means that you're following him with his people. And, and that's pretty clear in, in the Gospels. It's, you're not set apart in that sense. Um, and Jesus set that up so that we would do that with other people. And so even the, even in the Great Commission, right, it's, it's go and make disciples, right? You, you, to be a disciple, to be taught, implies what? There's some relationship, right? You can't just you can't just be a random disciple that isn't connected to anybody and is not being in any way a disciple. Um, yet there is an implied relationship even in the Great Commission. Um, and one of the other ways that we see this too is that we know we're following Jesus by other people also confirming that and witnessing that in our lives. Um, and so. That's again where I would go to the to the person who's at VCU who says I'm a Christian, but there's there's literally no one in his life that could even say brother like you are you're sinning right now or like why don't we pray together or any any of these other things that Christians do together there's nothing there for him to do that there's no people there to do that with and so we don't see a specific verse but we see a lot of implication and the question comes up and arises. How can you be obedient to these commands in Scripture, right, if you're not a, a member of a church, if you're not committed to a specific church? So Matthew 18, they take it to the church. You have to have a church to be able to take it to. And they have to be able to see and understand that you are a Christian at that church and that you are in relationship with those people there. Uh, Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders. You have to have church leaders. You have to have a. You have to be in a church that has church leaders for you to be able to obey, right? To be able to even obey that command. And what's doubly implied in that passage is that those leaders will give an account for you and your soul. And so, even here at GBC, it's like, who are the elders? Like, who are the elders going to give an account to? For God, right? God's going to come to them and say, like, who are the, the people that you shepherd, and who was under your watch? And so the church then needs to have a way to be able to say, these people are under, <laughs> under shepherding, right? These people are under the watch of a shepherd, right? And, and it, it's, it, it's too much for just somebody to walk in the door and all of a sudden the elders are then also accountable for that person. So there has to be a way to be able to give an account for who's there or not. There's over 45 one another commands in scripture. And so, and in almost the overwhelming content of all those things is within the context of believers in a church. And Paul's writing to specific churches and giving them these lists. And so the question is, how can you one another somebody, right? How, how can you be responsible for one anothering or not one anothering right, if you're not in a committed relationship with them? Uh, and I think if you just kind of want to look at the, the circles of what we're supposed to do, like loving your neighbor looks like sharing the gospel with them. Um, loving a, another believer is, is like, it, it's all those things of like encouraging and, and, and helping them in their sanctification and praying for them and, and all those types of things. But in the context of a church and, and membership, there, there's an actual joyful, <coughs> fulfilling obligation to do that. Right? You're not held accountable for uh, did you pray for the Christians that were that are in West Virginia today? It's like no, you know, like they, they, you're not. They aren't in relationship with you that way. But you are accountable for how you are serving and ministering to the Christians that you are in relationship with at a church. And so, if you're not in relationship with those Christians, then it's hard to fulfill those one another's in a way that um, seems consistent with how Scripture talks about it. Um, and then, yeah, so just going through some of those passages is Acts 2, right? So the, it's the, all those people were added to that number, the church. Acts 6, they knew the widows of their number. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul tells them to remove from their number, from their Christian, from their body, the unrepentant sinner. 1 Corinthians as a whole, he right, talks about when you come together as a church. So clearly they knew how, like what that looked like, of who was there, who wasn't. So, and Christians as a whole, right, we're, we're united around the gospel, uh, and in, in a church, right, we're united around this gospel, and because of our unique commitment to one another, 
we hold we can hold one another accountable right we, we can encourage one another we can exhort one another we can build up one another like we know who those people are that we're supposed to be doing that with uh, we can pray for one another we can worship with one another we can give for, to one another we can run after one another if one is in sin like we know like this, this, this person committed with us they're running away in sin that, that's the person we run after and so it's not a random group but it's a group that knows its own okay so why should you be a member so I, I just so and I know there's people in this class that I know aren't members and so like that's it's good to be able to talk through some of these things um, I mean I think you should be a member because the Bible is just full of examples of Christians who are obedient to follow Christ into his people into the others who are also following Christ and this this commitment this accountability it's it's for your benefit also it's not it's not just so that we can say oh good got you another name on the list no it's like it's for your benefits so that you can grow as a Christian so that you can be held accountable so that you can uh, know that people will run after you if you're running away from God so that there can be people that can pray with you and, and encourage you and, and do the one and others with you because they know that you are committed also to them in that way um, and, but it's also so that you can do that for others right? there's that benefit that goes that way as well it's for others as well that commitment, that accountability, that's for others. That's so you can serve, so that you can do those things to other people as well. And so in, in, in Scripture, in the New Testament, right, we have this illustration, multiple places, of the body, the body of, of believers. Right? And so Paul, Paul talks about it uh, in 1 Corinthians and in Ephesians. Right? The, the body has all these members. Right? They're all doing everything together for the good of the whole body. Right? So like if you have your hand is trying to do something separate than your foot, like yeah, you, you, the body's not functioning. But once the body's all working together, right, the body functions well and it, it builds itself up, it encourages itself, right? It's building itself up in love, as we saw in Ephesians 4. So the question is, are you like a foot? Are you a, a toenail? Are you a wrist? Like what are you? Um, or are you just an amputated finger, right? In, in that sense, like if you if you aren't a part of the body at all then you, you're not helping build up the body, right? You're just this lone body part out there trying to be by itself. Um, and the body can't use that. And you can't help the body. And so the, so I think Paul is pretty clear when he's talking through that. It's like there's this purposefulness of what it is to be a Christian in your faith and how you share that faith and are connected to others. And so if you're a Christian, church attendance without membership has all the benefits of the church but without any of the accountability. And like on our side as a church, like it's like we should encourage all the Christians who are here to be members with us so that we can all be together on this. Um, and then on your end, it's like, yeah, you should come in and tie in with us. And if it can't be here, then it should be at a church where you can do that. And we would encourage that. Like we wouldn't say, like if, you, if you're out of it, I can't be a member of this church. They were like, okay, well then go be, at, go be at a church where you can be committed and accountable and they can be committed and accountable to you as well. Um, two other thoughts on that. Um, like our world now is very transient. It's more transient than it was 100 years ago. Definitely more than even probably the time when, when the apostles were talking and, and writing. Um, but membership helps tie us together. It helps pull in people, right, that might have entirely different backgrounds, different interests, different jobs, different just places in life and cultures. It pulls us together and ties us together around the same gospel and around the same eternal heavenly citizenship. And so that it's one of these things that, that pulls us in and, and reminds us of what's connecting us and what's uniting us. And that's a good thing. Um, so membership, it might seem like a risk. I mean, you're joining with a bunch of other people and you might have... Um, concerns there might be you, you might feel like that's not going to help you you're, 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 you've been trapped or whatever it is but it actually does provide a security and a confidence because you know that the brothers and sisters around you hold to the same gospel they're all desiring to grow in their faith and they are knowing uh, who the other people are in this community as well and so there's this desire to live out scripture together and there's a desire to help those who need help and to strengthen those who need to be strengthened and encourage those who need to be encouraged 
And that's what it does. And so it, it, it is this confidence, it is the security. And I, I know that myself when, I, when I'm around all the saints, especially, I, I, I'm especially reminded of it when we do like the members uh, things on Sunday evening services, when we all stand up as members to receive a member. And it's just so cool to be able to look around at all of these other members who are united with me in the gospel. And I can know like this is my brother and this is my sister and we all share the same faith and we all share the same love and we're all here together to help one another. And that's just, that's a good thing. Okay. So how to become a member. So how to become a member. So this is more GBC specific. Um, it's, it's very simple actually. And it's been made simpler because of our cool technology and apps and online forms and all that. And it's, it's really just a simple application. And the application um, will ask you a, like a few basic things, right? Like, how are you a Christian? Like, how did that happen? Like, what is your testimony? Um, have you been baptized or not? Like, that's important to know. Um, what, what's your church background? Did you grow up in a Catholic church? Or did you grow up, well, I'm gonna say that's not a church, right? Did you grow up in the Catholic <laughs> things that, that Catholics do? Um, <laughs> Or are you uh, from a Methodist church? Or did you grow up Southern Baptist? Or have you never been to church before at all, ever in your life? Um, that's important. That's helpful for, for even for the elders especially to know how to, to shepherd and care and provide and love uh, you um, and, and even help you, encourage you in the, in the membership process. Um, it's also the time where we talk through theology and like, do you have differences in beliefs with what you believe and what Grace Bible Church teaches. And then that's not a huge, huge deal necessarily, um, as long as we're united on like the big main things. Um, but like that, that's where you kind of can talk about it. And, that, and we provide that open forum to be able to talk about it. Um, so, and we want to talk about it if you're concerned there. Um, it's where we talk about how to be a church member. And we're gonna go through some of this at the end here, but like how to be engaged with membership at GBC, how to, do the one another's in our church. We also talk about church discipline. Like church discipline is an important part of membership. And that's kind of where we see the Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5. Like church discipline is the way that um, the church protects itself with the gospel. As, in other words, like that's how we can keep um, the body full of people that are believing and confessing and repenting and all united around the same faith. And if you're tied to, right, in one sense, people who are living in blatant sin and, and unwilling to repent, right, that's a poor testimony and witness of the gospel. And it's, so instead of saying, look at this great God that we worship and how awesome it is that we're all united around the same faith, people can just point at it and go like, but that guy is totally a hypocrite and he's not even repenting of his sin. Uh, and so, and, and Paul is right to say like, yeah, that's not good. Like, as a church, you can't have that. And so church discipline is a way to, to run after those who are in sin and to try to restore them and, and bring them back to repentance and like, reunite them back with God and with the rest of the church. But it's also the way to, to keep the gospel protected as a church. And so we even talk about that uh, in the membership meeting. So if that's something that, that is a concern. And I know for, for a lot of people, like that's something that is different at GBC that other churches maybe haven't done. Um, or maybe they've witnessed like how it was done poorly. Uh, and so there's concerns there. Um, and we talk about um, kind of in that membership application, just the, like, what have you read what we teach and, and what our commitments are to one another. Um, and we even ask you about ways that you want to serve the body and, and that, that type of thing as well. Um, so what about then that meeting? So that meeting is basically going through what you wrote on your application and just talking to you about it. And so it's not like we pull out a quiz and are like, all right, give me the structure and, and order of Deuteronomy and tell me all the laws and why they're important for Israel. Like we don't, we don't, I don't, I don't think Rick does that. So, no, no okay. Rick doesn't do that at all. No, Rick will talk to you a lot. So Rick likes talking. Some of our elders, some of our elders really like to have long, engaging membership uh, things and in a good way. Like they just love getting to know people and meeting them. And so, uh, Rick's Thanks friendly. for putting that in the best light. Yeah, Rick's friendly that <laughs> way. Yeah, so it's good. Um, so what happens in that, in that membership meeting? Well, we, we go through uh, 
those those questions that you answered we talk about the gospel like that's really kind of like the big thing like do you believe the gospel and are we clear on the gospel that are we are we believing in the same gospel really um and sometimes even at, at in those meetings not in a bad way but we can sometimes say like well why don't we slow down this membership process for a second uh, and just ask you to hold off so that we can get to know you more so you can get to know us more um so that we can be sure that you really know the gospel that you believe, like we, we think you, you do, but we want to make sure, right, before we like really kind of tie you to us in that sense. And we want to make sure that, um, that that you have that clarity, that we have that clarity for you. And like, let's just sometimes get to know you more. Um, and so we'll sometimes ask to, to slow down on that. Um, but that's really, that's how it works. And it's really simple. Um, and so then the next step then is that you're meeting normally with an elder for the application process. And then the elders will come to the church and say, Grace Bible Church, we've met with so-and-so. They want to be a member here. We've heard the gospel clearly proclaimed from them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give you their testimony of, of their, their desire to be here as a member and what they believe about the gospel and some of those kind of basic questions. And we'll let you see them and talk to them and, and ask them questions and, and be engaged with them in that sense. And then after about two weeks of having that out there, at least two weeks, um, well, at an SEF meeting, so one of our Sunday evening fellowships, we'll all come together and we'll ask, hey, members, please come tonight. Like We're, we're doing a, a church thing for members, right? for members to be engaged with the congregation, and we'll just we'll bring them into membership. And so the way we do that is we, we have our members stand. You, some of you, I'm pretty sure most of you have been there. We have our members stand. We read. Uh, we have these kind of, it's not really a covenant. I don't really know what to call it. I don't know. Questions of commitment. Questions of commitment. Yeah, we all come together and we, we share in those. And those are encouraging for us to be reminded of what we're trying to do with this member, what this member is trying to do with us. Um, and then we bring them into our body. And it's that simple, right? It's not like we have to, I don't know, it's not like applying for like a, a housing loan or something like that. It's, not, it's nothing complicated. It's not like you're, all these other things are happening. It's really just like, do you believe the gospel and do you want to be here with us? And they're like, yes, <laughs> we want you to be here with us too. And we believe the same gospel. So let's bring you in. Okay, so why do we say engaged member in 20 minutes or less? So we say engaged member. So is that like a super status of church member? Like there's regular members and there's engaged members? No, that's just our way of saying, like, hey, we were actually really serious about what the Bible says about what Christians are supposed to be doing in a church. Um, because biblically, every member of a church should be engaged. Every every person that's a part of that regular gathering that's committed to one another should be engaged with that church. And so that's kind of where we run through the one another's. Um, and I don't know, kind of maybe to cap it all off, is like the New Testament is not written to solo Christians to live a solo Christian life, but it's written to Christians who are in churches and living life, the Christian life together. And so that's why we say engaged member. And so... First of all, and probably one of the primary ways that I think this is like very biblically important for membership, is members are engaged in the congregation. Engaged in the congregation. Um, and I came up with four R's. And I felt really clever about it because I'm not good at those types of things. So I came up with four R's that I thought helped explain what this engaged member of the congregation looks like. And the first R is this, receiving. Receiving Members are receiving. So the keys to the church of who's in and who's out of the church are in the hands of the congregation. They're in the hands of the congregation. They're not put in the hands of the elders. The elders don't get the ultimate call in that sense of like who is in and who's out. They recommend it. And as members, like we should be listening to what our elders are recommending. Like they're saying this person doesn't believe the gospel. And then we should be like, okay, well, that's really important for us to know. Um, but otherwise, right, we should trust our, member, our elders when they're like, hey, this person's a Christian. And then as a church, as a congregation, as members, the, the responsibi responsibility lies in their hands. And we say think this is based off of Matthew 16 and 18 and 1 Corinthians 5. Um, the responsibility rests in their hands to, to bring that person into membership, to receive that person as one of their own members. And so... Um, yeah, it's a responsibility that, that, that the members have. It's um, they, they can't just sit back and kind of expect the church to happen around them or the elders to do everything. 
or just uh, Rick's preaching all the time, so he clearly is the one that's in charge and has to do all this stuff. Like, no, actually, you as a member of a church, right, you have that responsibility to bring in those members, to receive them. Um, the second R is reminding. Members also have a responsibility to remind one another of our shared confession. And so I think that the primary way we do this is really through communion. It's, to, it's coming together as believers and saying, yes, this is, this is what we believe, right? This is the, the God that we believe, the God who died for us, right? Who sacrificed himself for us. And we're doing this all together with the hope of looking to the future, of that we will one day be with him for forever with all of us all together there. So we're reminding one another of the gospel. Um, third, restoring. So members have a responsibility from, especially from Matthew 18, to, to try to seek to restore one another if, one, if somebody's in sin. And so um, if a member is in sin, the rest of the members have that responsibility to run after that one and to to point back to the gospel and say, look how great our God is, right? You can, you can repent of the sin and be restored back to him and be restored back to our fellowship too. Um, so we have that responsibility. That's not a, a thing that we can just ignore. Um, lastly, uh, we, have the, we have the fourth R is removing. So members also have the responsibility to, to release members from their body. And so uh, sometimes this can look like, and it's really simple in, in some ways. Um, it can just be somebody's moving, right? They're, they're moving from here to San Diego, right? So like, how are they gonna be able to gather with us regularly when they're in San, San Diego? Like they're not gonna be able to. So right, we are, our almost instructive to them is like, okay, find a church there that preaches the same gospel that we believe and plug in there. and. And we hear that that happens, and then we release them. Um, but we actually do have to release them. Uh, I think uh, there was an illustration that I actually, I'll do right now with Mike. I'll do this right now with Mike. Mike, shake my hand. All right, so now let go. Okay, but I'm still holding on. So Mike is the member, right, of the church, right? And he's, and he's left, and he's like, I'm, I'm being released. I'm like, well, I, as a church, I actually have to let go too and say, okay, you're released. Now you can go shake this church's hand over here. Like we have to actually do that as a church. And so what we'll do, on, that we'll also do that on Sunday evenings um, as a church, we'll stand up and say, hey, we've released this member to this church and this person moved over here and they're, like, and, we're, and we're doing that to remind the members, hey, this person still believes the gospel. So just because you don't see them anymore doesn't mean something bad's happened. They've just moved. And so we want to let you know that. So you're not trying to run after somebody that's in San Diego and you don't know why they're there. Uh, it's trying to be responsible in that way. But members also have the responsibility to remove those in hardened, unrepentant <coughs> sin. And so really what it is, is it's saying, actually, you're not a member. In fact, you're not even a believer is, is what that looks like. And that's really hard, and it's it hurts sometimes, especially because it's sometimes it's people that, that many of the members know well, and, and somebody that's in sin and, and unwilling to listen and unwilling to repent after repeated, like, please, um, after even time has been given to just to let them come to their senses, to see the consequences of their sin. But ultimately, I mean, when, it, when they're just, it's clear that they're not repenting, or it's just so grievous in that sense, you have to remove that unrepentant member from your body. And so that's also a responsibility of the members. And so when we say, hey, are you an engaged member at GBC? We're saying, hey, these four things, right? Receiving, reminding, restoring, removing, those are your responsibilities as a member. They're not somebody else's, like that's on you. So you have to be taking that seriously and thinking through that. All right, we're gonna run through the rest of these pretty quickly. Um, we say engaged member, we mean engaged in worship. Engaged in worship. And so what does that look like first? Well, it's just gathering together to, to be together to worship. And so it's the pattern of Acts that we see. They gathered on the, on the first day of the week, and they came together and they worshiped. Um, Hebrews 10.25, right? We already referenced this. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. So when whoever preached or, or wrote Hebrews... Originally, like that was already an issue, is that some people that were claiming to be with the body, they were claiming the name of Christ, were not gathering, right? So that was that, that was becoming a habit of them. 
And so it's, don't do that. Don't neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. But encourage one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So that coming together and gathering together is that is that coming together to encourage and to point back to Jesus is coming back. And this is important for all of us to be here. Um, but how else do we worship together? Uh, we we sing together. That's that's really important. Um, Ephesians 5, 19 through 21. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So it's it's that one another. Like we're supposed to sing to one another even uh, as we as we come together in worship. We're singing to God, but we're also reminding everybody else, hey, this is the God that we're singing to. Um, we're also engaged in our giving, uh, engaged in worship with our giving. And so uh, I thought uh, uh, Elder Andrew Townsend did a great job at our annual meeting, kind of just running through 2 Corinthians real quick and like why that's important and how giving is worship. Um, and it really is. Giving is an opportunity to worship with, with your money, with what God has given you and blessed you with. Um, it's an opportunity for God to receive glory through through that, and it's an opportunity to to love others and to demonstrate that love for others, even in a really tangible way, and to trust that God's given something to you, right, for a purpose, so that you can do that and bless others with it as well. And so, um, giving means taking part in what God is doing, even at GBC and through GBC, other places, and so we should do that in a worshipful way as members. Uh, I think this is probably one of the, the hallmarks of GBC, at least the way that we want to, to be word-centered and centered around the exposition of God's word. So engaged in discipleship. So that means we're, we're seeking to be obedient to Christ's command. So make disciples and teach. Uh, so we see that clearly through the, the, the ministry of the word. And so that's why it's important to, to be there, to be present for the preaching of God's word. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be ready in season. And then here's how the word is, is affecting people. So be ready in season and out of season. And here's what the people are, are needing. They're needing to be reproved, rebuked, and exhorted with complete patience and teaching. So when Paul's talking to Timothy, he's not saying, hey, go in a room and just preach all the time. He's saying, no, like, there's, a, there's a target, there's an audience, there's a, there's a group of people that need this. They need to be reproved, rebuked, and exhorted with the word of God. And so preaching of the word is very important um, in that sense. But we also would say that it's this, um, this commitment to do it to one another, right? To, to preach the word to one another, right? If somebody's having, <laughs> they're struggling with a sin, it's not just like, ah, it's like try harder, like don't sin. Like, no, it's like take the word of God and speak to this thing that they're struggling with. Like, encourage them in that way. Um, somebody's just downtrodden. They have no hope, right? They're, they're, they're just, um, they're, they're suffering in that sense. Well, like, that's where we can go to our Titus 2, 11 through 14 verse. It's saying, like, look, like, the grace of God is training you, right, to, to, to renounce the sin and so that you can be looking forward with hope to the appearing of our, of our Savior when he comes back. Like, there's a hope that you're supposed to have as a Christian. So have hope. Like, look to Jesus, um, that's a that's a way that we can come come alongside one another and engage in that even that like small discipling of like just speaking the word to somebody in that way. First uh, Thessalonians five fourteen says, and we urge you brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. And so like in the church, right, this is what's supposed to be happening. Um, one of the ways that really tangibly happens at GBC is through fellowship groups. So I don't know how many of you all are in the fellowship group or not, and it's not required, but it is really encouraged. Um, but that's where we, we do more ministry of the word, right? We, we talk, I know some groups talk through the sermon reflection questions. Some, uh, some groups are studying books of the Bible. Some of them are studying topical books on, on different things. But it, it's really coming together to be discipled under the word of God. Um, and so that's where there's that accountability. That's where there's connecting over these things to where you can pray and do the one anothering. Um, discipling at GBC as members also looks like just one on one relationships. And so that can be um, just it can be a, a few times like, hey, brother, like I was really encouraged by seeing you at fellowship group last week. Like, let's just go grab coffee. Right. And just pray together. Uh, but maybe it could be a little bit more targeted. It could be very intentional. And it's like, hey, I am struggling with 
a sin, right? I'm struggling with a sin. Can you help me? Can you come alongside me and hold me accountable? And we'll, we'll read God's word together. We'll pray over it. You can talk to me about it. I can, I can encourage you through this too, maybe. And then we'll come together and be intentional in that way. Um, sometimes it's just like, hey, I just need that fellowship. I just need somebody to be able to, to point me back to scripture. And so if I know that I'm getting that every Friday morning because I'm meeting with Brother Mike, like, that's a good thing, right? And so we, we have that um, intentional right, in, in discipleship, that one-on-one -on -one discipleship. I mean, it also just looks like life on life. And so uh, that's where hopefully, right, you're not just showing up on a Sunday morning and then peace out and then you're back Sunday morning. Right, it's it's showing up Sunday morning and and seeing like ah there's there's people here that I can that I can love and I can I can serve and I can pray for and I can do these other things and I can do that best right if I'm inviting them into my home for dinner and I'm going over there and helping them with something or that type of thing is is living that life on life not just Sunday on Sunday. All right, so members are also engaged in service, engaged in service. So God's given many spiritual gifts to his people. And so right, if you're a Christian, God's even in a, in a special way, given you abilities to be able to serve him um, through, through what isn't you. <laughs> it's really it's through him and it's for his glory. But it's not to serve just whatever interest, right? It's really for the purpose of building up and edifying the body. And so members are all called, all Christians are called in the church right, to do that for one another for the benefit of one another, not to puff yourself up, but for the benefit of one another. So I, I really would encourage you, like, the best way to, 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 to do this is to just see a need and jump in, right? And so I think sometimes uh, we as believers can be caught up in like, is this my gift or not? Like, should I, I really wanna be finding out what my gift is so I can know how to do it in the church. Well, sometimes it's just like, hey, they need, a, they need a driver to go down to BCU for high school kids on Wednesday. So it's like, I, I can drive a car. Like, I can do that. Um, it's like, hey, wait, I mean, Marco Silva is our deacon over cleaning. I know he will never say no to somebody that asks him, like, hey, do you need help with any of the cleaning at the church on Sundays? Um, he'll, he'll say, absolutely. Like, we, we always could use help to serve there. Um, so it's just, it's just seeing the needs in the body and meeting it in that way. And so, it's, and that's really what it is to be a believer: is to be serving one another. And so, it's cleaning, it's children's ministry, it's, it's providing meals for people, it's teaching in, in children's classes, it's praying for one another, it's even praying for people, and you never like you you don't even see them. Like you're just going through the the one church app, and you're scrolling, and you're like, let me pray for all the M's today. And just throughout the day, you just pray for all the M's, all the last names of M in the in the church. And there's a lot of them actually. Um, <laughs> It's also uh, hospitality and just bringing people into your life and, and, and being welcoming and loving. It's trying to find the people that need that too. It's just saying like, ah, it seems like you're struggling to connect here. Like, let me, let me bring you in and just ha talk to you about your faith and how you came to know Jesus and give you dinner. Like, sometimes that's, just, that's what people need. Um, and that's how we can serve one another. Um, it's even, it's sometimes it's, it's meeting specific needs through giving. And so if so, somebody needs a new car or they're, they're having they're struggling with with um meals or or they're not they're not they're not they're between jobs and, they're, and there's there's just the lack of finances and sometimes it's just jumping in and helping there serving there okay so engage to care we'll run through this so as members right we are we're called to to not only meet needs but to actively um I don't know the best way to say this, to actively care about what's happening in our church, to actively care about what's happening with, with a brother or sister. And it's not to just sit back and be passive in that sense and just go, I hope it's going okay over there. It's to, it's to be involved and to be caring. And so that's where that serving and that discipling kind of intersects and comes together really specifically in meeting needs. And so that's why we have like prayer emails. Like when we say, hey, this is a prayer need for our church such and such is, is about to have surgery or something, or there's been an emergency here or something like that. And so it's, it, we have those types of things that are broadcasted and, and just serving the body, just like even praying for the saints that are here. Um, sometimes people are asking for advice and for counsel. Sometimes it's seeing somebody's in sin and being willing to say something to them, right? Not, not to just 
go talk about it with somebody else. <laughs> but to go to that person and say, look, like, I, like you weren't really kind to how you, you, when you talked to your son just now, that wasn't kind. And I don't know, I, I struggle with that as well. And I just want to encourage you to like, here's how our speech should be, or here's how, I, that kind of thing. In a helpful way and pointing back to God's word and giving it a gospel anchored focus, not just be better, but like, this is what Christ has called us to. Um, so it's sometimes it's giving a rebuke or, or giving an exhortation or giving encouragement in a very targeted way. So, and lastly, it's engaged in the mission of the church. So a member should be engaged with the mission of the church. Um, and I think Rick really covered this well last week. I mean, the mission of the church is, is really it's spreading out the, the worship uh, of, the, of God to all creation through making disciples, through having people that can then worship and glorify God because of what Jesus has done for them. And so that's our, that's our mission as a church. And as members of the church, like we share in that mission. We share in that responsibility. So one way that looks really tangibly here at Grace is like how we do our finances. Like we, we are very intentional with trying to, to get, the, get the gospel out to people that are serving in, in hard to reach places or serving in places where the gospel is, is really needed. Um, so it's, it's supporting missionaries through that. Um, so giving to that. Um, it's going out and doing the disciple. Like when Jesus says, make, make disciples, I mean, that's, that's us, actually. That's, that's our mission. That's not like we have missionaries for that. Like, no, that's, that's us as members. We are to go to others that don't know Christ and share the gospel with them so that they would, right, turn and, and trust and believe and, and be changed and be transformed and be a disciple as well. And so that's our, our multiplying mission. And so that discipling, that evangelism, like that's, that's what we're trying to do at the church. That's what we're trying to equip the saints for, for their work of ministry, and to be able to go do that well. Um, and so as a member, like that's, that's something we should be thinking about. It's not just, ah, uh, Sunday's coming, and then I know we have fellowship group, and then I know my kids want to go do something in the summer, and then we're just going to do that again the next year. Like that's, that's just kind of this, that's not what the Christian life is for. The Christian life is more engaged than that. And so I would encourage you then, right, if you are, if you're a Christian, but not a member, right, and it's like, why, why, why can't you commit here, right? And, and if there is a reason why, then that's fine. <laughs> but like, it's like, go to a church where you can be committed. Um, be at a church where you can be accountable, where they can be accountable to you and you can be accountable to them. Um, but I would encourage you, like, I mean, there is nothing stopping you from, from starting your membership application tonight or asking questions about it if you have questions or concerns. Um, so just go somewhere where you can be obedient to these things in Scripture. Um, and hopefully that's here at GBC. And if you are a member, then be engaged, right? This is not, uh, it's easy to lose focus. It's easy to become not engaged. Uh, that's kind of why... You are told, you are exhorted, you are encouraged, and why Paul writes these things, why Peter writes these things, um, so that we would be kind of reinvigorated with the gospel and how that affects us in our life and how that affects others. So be engaged, stay engaged, look for ways to be able to to serve and to preach and to and to share and disciple, because um, that's what this church is for is for doing that. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not just to show up on Sunday. So. I think that's all I have. I'm a little bit over time, so we're not going to do the discussion questions. I think Rick and I are both really thankful for, I know, I know Rick and I are very thankful for all of you and, and sticking it out with us and being willing to learn how we are teaching through our distinctives because we kind of figured that out along the way too. Uh, but I'm thankful, thankful for all of you.